how the system actually works right now. And I want to emphasize, we have a world food system. It's based on large multinational companies. It's based on private uh, profits. It's based on a very, very low measure of international transfers to help poor people, sometimes none at all. It's based on extreme irresponsibility of powerful countries with regard to the environment. And it's based on a radical denial of rights of poor people, as we just heard. It's interesting, we ask, we heard from the minister of DRC, what's wrong with your country? Well, we don't even start by saying the King of Belgium created a slave colony for 30 years. The government of Belgium ran the slave colony for another 40 years. The CIA assassinated your first popular leader, Mr. Lumumba, and then installed another dictatorship for the next 30 years. And then Glencore and others now suck out your cobalt without giving you tax income. We don't reflect on that. We say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you govern properly? And so we have a system, but we need a different system. <laughs> we cannot turn this over to the private sector. We already did about 100 years ago. Not only to the private sector, to the private sector with the US military behind it. And the different system has to be based on principles of human dignity in the Universal Declaration, principles of sovereignty, principles of economic rights, because these are not nice things to do. In 1948, all the government said that food is a right, social protection is a right, not a nice thing, not a pleasant thing, a right. That was 73 years ago. The SDGs are nothing more than our generation's attempt to honor the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I come from a country that not only doesn't care about the world's poor, it doesn't even care about its own poor. One in seven Americans is hungry right now. And they don't care. I mean, the poor people care. But one political party, all it cares about is cutting taxes for the rich and filibustering any solution. So we're in a world that's really tough. The private sector is not going to solve this problem. I'm sorry to say to all of the private sector leaders, behave, pay your taxes, follow the rules. That's what you should do. And what the governments should do is the following. They won't, but they should. First, the G20 should become the G21 by inviting systemically the chairperson of the African Union and the African Union to be the 21st country. The, 20, the European Union is a member of the G20 as the EU. If you add the AU as the 21st for the G21, you add 1.4 billion people to representation at that crucial event. That will change decisively the discussion because 1.4 billion people are not at the table for finance right now, and they need to be. So my first recommendation is the G21. I love the G20. Add one seat, 1.4 billion people with the AU represented. Second, we need a order of magnitude change of development finance. The rich countries just borrowed $17 trillion for COVID. The poor countries, nothing, because the rich countries can borrow at zero and the poor countries pay 5 or 10% coupon rates 
or have no access at all. So the world exposed its grotesque inequality this past year and a half. Rich countries didn't say, we tighten our belts, why don't you? My country spent $7 trillion of emergency funding, not one penny for anybody else, by the way. $7 trillion, it didn't even cross the imagination of the U.S. Congress to include a few crumbs for the rest of the world. But the poor countries cannot borrow. That's what we should have heard from the World Bank. I didn't hear that from the World Bank. The final thing is we need the UN as the core and central institution of this world, period. Because this is the only way we're going to have a civilized world is a strong UN. And it cannot be that the whole UN budget is less than my neighborhood's budget in New York. The UN core budget this year is $3 billion. New York City's budget is $100 billion. And then we say, why don't things work well? Because the rich are hoarding everything.